something is off with who you're bringing in. And if you turn on the ad spend, you're just going to bring in more of the wrong people. So how do you make sure that like your marketing brings in the right person? Welcome to Profit and Prosper, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are ready to make some money while doing what they love. On this podcast, we're going to pull back the curtain and talk about all things business and money, but I promise you this is not your typical boring numbers talk. I'm your host, Sarah Young, a CPA and CFO with over a decade of experience in finance, business, and leadership. I'm going to share everything I've learned from helping my clients grow more profitable businesses and keep more of what they earn while growing my own successful business along the way. You'll feel empowered and confident that you too can grow your wealth, live a rich life, and have an impact. Stick with me and you might even start to think that finance is fun. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another episode of the Profit and Prosper podcast. This week, I have a really great interview for you with Erin Breeden of Blue Tide Creative. Blue Tide Creative is a strategic communications firm that rescues clients from the shallows. Blue Tide offers public relations, strategic consulting, marketing, branding, and creative storytelling services. I wanted to have Erin come on this week because she is a marketing pro, y'all. She has been in this game for many, many years, and she is so good at big picture marketing strategy, which I know a lot of business owners really struggle with because there's so much, you know, shiny object syndrome in the business world around marketing. So in this interview, we talked about everything from where business owners waste time and money in marketing She talked about the foundational pieces that everybody needs to have in place before, you know, spending a lot of time and money on another marketing strategy. We talked about why it's important to have marketing KPIs and so much more. So let's dive into the episode. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to this week's episode. Erin, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Sarah, so so much for having me on. So I am really excited to talk about all things marketing and how to get the most out of your marketing dollars, how to not throw money out the door on marketing, which we both know happens all the time. Before we jump into that, just tell us a little bit about you and your business. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm Erin Breeden, and I am the CEO and head mermaid of Blue Tide Creative. Yes, I said head mermaid, because if you take a risk on yourself and and go out and start your own business, you can give yourself whatever title you want. Um, And my background is in marketing and public relations and even um, in journalism, so a lot of content creation. Um, And when I realized that there wasn't a perfect job for me that would allow me to use all these skills to serve clients, I decided instead of picking a lane, I would just start my own business. So now I working with businesses um, of all sizes, but my passion is always with the small business owner um, and wanting to make sure that they have an understanding of of marketing, that they have an understanding of messaging, because it's through your messaging that you tell your story and your story brings in your clients and your customers. Yes. So your messaging, as an example, your messaging starts off with, I'm the head mermaid of Blue Tide Creative. And that is totally, I assume, a branding messaging choice that probably brings in your ideal clients and does a good job of repelling people who you don't want to work with, right? Exactly. Exactly. Because, um, yeah, it, it has the the people who are like, uh, I don't know if I want to work with her. And then other people are like, well, maybe she's the one that can take me to the next level and give me some new insight that someone hasn't given me before. So yeah, absolutely. It was a branding choice. So tell us first, um, what even is marketing? I like to talk about marketing. And if you have a visual of it, marketing is an umbrella. So you've got the shape of it, you've got the, uh, you know, the fabric, but you need other components to create those spokes so that when you open the umbrella, it gives it shape. So underneath marketing, those spokes are going to be public relations, they're going to be um, graphic design, they're going to be advertising, they're going to be your digital presence, so, you know, your social media, but also your SEO and your website. 
So it's all those pieces together that form marketing, because if marketing was just by itself, it would be just focused on sales and promotions. Um, but of course, as business owners, we want to bring people in. We want to you know, have um, either our products or our services um, purchased or have people you know, work with us. But it is those spokes um, that actually give a brand uh, the brand and make, kind of give it that human, that humanized character that bring people in and keep them engaged. Because if you're just doing marketing, you're just you need this sales, sales, sales. You're not showing them and you're not telling them your story that will then make them a customer and a client. Yeah, I tend to think of marketing and you can correct me or add some color, but I tend to think of it as everything that I'm doing to make people aware of who I am and who my business, who my business is, what my business does. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of bringing them in to the point where, I'm on a sales call or they're on my website about to make a purchase. And then it sort of switches in my mind over to like sales. No, that's, that's exactly right or wrong. Right. Yeah. Cause you're nurturing them. You're, you're, you're meeting them where they're at. You're understanding what your audience is, is needing and what you can provide and how you can solve a problem. And then as you start to build trust, which is a huge portion um, of marketing is, is you want to bring trust in, you want to build those relationships and then when you have them in, that's when you can say, hey, here's a program I'm doing or here's a service I offer. And by that time, they already know you or your business and they're ready to make a purchase. Okay. So with that sort of framework in mind, where do you see business owners putting a lot of their focus and time and energy and money? And I'm asking that sort of knowing that in many cases, the money and the time and energy goes into the, the wrong place, right? Or it goes not, I don't want to say wrong place, but it's just not in the best, you know, they don't necessarily get the best return on their spending. Like for example, like brand new business owners, like what do they always do? They spend a ton of time on a website design, probably sometimes on like a fancy logo and branding and all of these things. But in my opinion, I'm like, that's really not where you need to put your time and energy. So where do you see people putting their money and time in terms of marketing? And, you know, is that the right place or the wrong place? Yeah. And I think you kind of nailed what you were touching on about like where they're spending money, where they're putting it. Um, I think we can talk about this even more is a lack of strategy and focus because when you start your business, it's, there's so much coming at you at once. You know, you're like, did I, you know, put my paperwork for LLC? Do I need a CPA? Do I need software for this? Do I need, you're, you're doing so much to build the business, to build the infrastructure. And then once you spent the money on that, you're like, oh, I got to do all these things because I got to bring people in. Um, and I think you're also right. I think the things we see is with the lack of strategy and focus, um, people try to do everything at once you know, they will hire someone to do social media, but maybe they haven't taken the time to really figure out what their brand identity is. You know, what's their, their tone, their messaging, all those things, their core mission statement. They will spend money on a website. They'll spend money on um, a, you know, logo, all those things you talked about, but they're not spending, they're not taking the time to really build that foundation of their, you know, kind of their communications and their sales and their marketing. So the thing I see a lot with small businesses is a, the website, I've watched businesses drop $10,000 on this beautiful website, and then it is nothing but text heavy. You, you get to a point where you look at all this text and you're like, I am done. And people log out of your website and they leave because they don't know where they're going, don't know how to navigate. Another thing I think people spend money on is their logo. You know, we all, when we start off, want to have a great logo, um, but you can do stuff now in Canva, have a temporary one. And I think what businesses also forget is that as you grow, your logo can change. Things can, you know, you can evolve and elevate. And I mean, I'll even say on the website, I didn't have a website for probably the first three and a half years of my business. <laughs> and I still had clients and customers coming in because I understood my messaging. I understood my audience. And then another thing I really see money being spent at is 
a crazy amount being spent on different online classes. Um, and not to say that all of them are, are bad, but just there's some when you're getting started and you're taking this more like advanced sales funnel class that you're spending, you know, $2,000 on X amount of thousand dollars on, and you're working on these sales funnels, but you don't even understand who your audience is first. You're just wasting all that money. And I think the mistakes are maybe stem from watching what other people are doing or hearing from other people. I mean, it's great to have other entrepreneurs and small business owners that you talk to, but you always have to remember people on our different path and, it, and they're in different places. And yeah, I would say the big things I see the, the money just going out and initially are um, expensive websites, expensive logos and the colors and things like that. And then these classes or um, even like masterminds or different things like that, where people take it but they don't have the basics to then, if they're learning how to do all these funnels, they don't have the basics to understand how to implement them for their own business. Yes. So what I wrote down, I like was taking notes and I have lots of questions, but it seems like we need to know the brand identity before really investing in anything. And I think that's hard because I'm thinking back to when I started my business I had no idea what the brand identity was. And even when I started to work on it, what I came up with then is wildly different than what I have now. What encompasses a brand identity? Like what are the pieces and parts that are so important? And then how do you figure that out? You know, and I think one of the things to always keep in mind is as we evolve, our businesses evolve, our messaging can evolve too. I always think when a business is starting out is really think about your who, what, when, where, why, how, you know, going back to, to grade school, um, think about what service you want to provide to people, the problem that it could potentially solve, how it can solve that problem. Um, who is your target audience? Who are the people that you think you can best serve? I know with my experience, I have two kind of different um, modules within my businesses. I work with larger companies on a more consulting, you know, strategic kind of that um, fractional chief marketing officer side. And then I have my small business side and they're completely, you know, different. So their audience, so those are two different audiences that I have to make sure I'm balancing. Um, but I would say the easiest thing for brand identity is First, really sit down and think about the who, what, when, where, why of your business and how, don't forget the how, and think about not only the clients that you have right now, but who is your dream client in five years? Who's your dream client in two years? And then once you kind of look at those of like, you know, where can they find you? Is it going to be a brick and mortar? Do you want the website? Do you want a landing page? Are you going to be exclusively on social media? There's no right, wrong answer. It just depends on what feels good to you and what's going to work with your audience. You know, when do they need you? When do they need to call you in? Sitting down and thinking about those questions, I think will help shape. And then the other two, the second one I think is your North Star, which is your mission statement. And again, this is something that can evolve as your business evolves. But if you kind of figure out your purpose and your intention, that is going to be your guiding force as you continue to build. And it'll prevent what I kind of call the squirrel syndrome. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Up, where there's that adorable dog and he's having conversation with the main character and then there's a squirrel and he gets distracted. Squirrel. And then he's like, hi, I'm back. You know, you can get easily distracted, but if you have kind of that North Star that's going to help guide you, it's really going to help. And then the third thing I always say is have your elevator pitch ready because you never know. You could be at a coffee shop. You could bump into somebody, you know, just things like that where you never know where you could interact with a person who is perfect for whatever your service offering is or whatever your business does. Do you have something that's prepared so that you can tell them in uh, 30 seconds quickly but succinctly what you're doing so that then they are kind of captured by that and then ask you maybe a follow-up question or remember you when they have a friend or a colleague that says they have this specific problem and you told them that you are someone who can solve it. 
Yes. So as you're saying all that, I was remembering one time this was, you know, like a year and a half ago, we were in our little like mastermind together. One time you pulled up an example website of somebody that you were working with and you showed their list of offers was like, they had probably 10 or 15 different service offerings on their website. And you were just talking about how like if you're if you're a customer coming to the website and like looking at this, you're gonna have no clue what the business is doing, who they're serving, like what is the best option for you. And I was thinking like when I started my business, I did that because I just kind of copied what other accountants do. Mm-hmm. And like let's be frank, most accounting websites are just straight out of the 90s. It's true. <laughs> and you know, they offer this huge like cheesecake factory buffet of services. But I think that getting, having clarity around like the pieces of the brand of the brand identity that you laid out also inform your offers of like knowing who you're serving and what your mission is here, then that should inform the offers because your offers will help you deliver on that, that statement of what you're doing and why and how. And that also informs, you know, who your client is, which then informs your messaging and can also inform your pricing, right? And so it's all, I think, connected. Do people, I think that what holds people up a lot thinking about these things is thinking it has to be perfect, right? And it can't change. So you've already said it can evolve with your business. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? Because if it was perfect, if we were waiting for perfection, we'd never launch, right? Yeah. (laughs) It would never be perfect enough. Yes. I think that, you know, you just kind of test it out, right? Like test out what you're doing and see how it works over the span of a few months, you know, see who it brings in and see what conversations you have and then reassess, right? If it needs to change, it changes. Are you ready to change your money story this year and feel confident about your next moves to create more profit and cash flow in your business? You've probably already thought about your business goals for the upcoming year, but I don't want you to forget the financial side of things. How can you make sure that you are taking action on the areas where you'll see the most immediate, biggest impact on your bottom line? Because having a wealth generating, profitable and resilient business doesn't happen by accident. You need to take intentional steps toward creating more profit. That's why I created my totally free financial review workbook. In it, I will walk you through how to assess your business's financial picture with no math required, how to think big picture about what worked and what didn't with your finances in the last year, and how to identify your next three money moves to make in the upcoming year. To get your free workbook, visit the link in the show notes or go to trustyoungco.com forward slash review and be on your way to a more profitable and aligned business. Let's say somebody's beyond starting up their business and they're getting to the point where they're ready to shift from, we'll call it like solopreneuring up into growing their business into you know, let's say mid six figures, like what are some of the things that that business owner needs to focus on? I think the thing that you need to focus on as you grow and as you get to the next level is again, always evaluate your messaging, making sure if you are elevating yourself, that your messaging meets you, you know, cause you, you don't want to keep it the same always. I mean, we've talked about our messaging has changed as our business has evolved And I think as you get to that next level, that's when you can start looking into what your needs are. You know, that's where you can start looking into, do you have needs where you need to have a a social media strategy? Um, You've maybe finally gotten your website, but you need to make sure that it has SEO. Um, Is it properly connected to Google Analytics so you can track, track everything? Um, are there things that you're doing that maybe you want to get in front of the media or are you, as you get to that level to further elevate your business with the things that you've learned, do you want to be on podcasts? Do you want to be a speaker at an upcoming seminar or session? You know, that's where you need to almost take again, another evaluation of the who, what, when, where, why, and how, um, I recommend when I'm working with clients of you know, get that foundation. Then when you get to either a certain year mark um, or when you get to a certain um, revenue mark, 
just depends on what it does. I always say when you're around that year three to five, do an evaluation. Then when you're between seven and 10 years in business, do that reevaluation again, um, because then you're going to be able to really see where you need to grow and where maybe you need to put more money in front of. I think there's things that can be done without, again, we want to be mindful of the money that we're bringing in. We want to be mindful of our numbers, but you know, there's amazing consultants that are out there if you're not ready to bring in a full-time person. And, you know, those are just things that you start to weigh as you continue to go on and grow. But I think the biggest things are go through that process again. Is your mission statement still the same? Look at your elevator pitch. Um, and then use those opportunities to see where you need to invest. You know, like we talked about, is it social media? Is it um, SEO and a more dynamic, um, more dynamically written website? Is it, you know, getting to these speaking levels or media interviews that you can put money in that? Is it continuing education? Is there something you either want to learn about or maybe you've brought somebody in and you want to have them learn about it? So it's just constantly evaluating. And I always say it's that one to three is when you start off with your foundation, three to five, reevaluate. And then when you get to seven and 10, also look at that as well. Yes. I think that I'll just sort of speak to my experience. Like as I've grown, I would say, you know, what worked for me when I started was referrals and networking lots of things that, you know, revolved around me directly, like going out and spreading the word and meeting people. And something that I talk about as business owners grow beyond, you know, solopreneuring, I think is using leverage in marketing. And so what that means is, and what that means in my opinion, is just starting to implement strategies that enable you to hit more than just like that one-to-one sort of referral networking partnership. But how do I get myself out in front of a larger audience? Can I leverage other people's audiences? You know, at what point do you bring in digital ads? And so the next thing I've been doing more recently is that next level of marketing, which is doing podcast interviews on other people's podcasts, speaking. I'm still a little bit like back and forth on if this actually works to bring people in. I don't have enough like data points. I'm still testing it to see. And then, you know, beginning at some point to like dabble in digital ads, I think also. So at what point do you think somebody can say, I'm ready for either PR, getting in the news or doing things like getting speaking engagements, podcast interviews? And then at what point are people ready for you know, digital ad spend? I recommend anybody before they put money in for a retainer, you know, whether it's someone they hire for PR for X amount of months or a social media person or someone to come in to update their, um, their ads or kind of look at that copywriting is to get a consult. It's cheaper. Um, it's more like one-on-one hands-on. It ends up saving you money in the long run. And it'll give you that opportunity to evaluate where you're at. When we're talking about, you know, the ad spend, it's really when you have, you know, product or an offering that you've done that is solid, that is good, um, that you have tried different ways of whether it has been speaking engagements, whether it's been other interviews, whether it's been on your own podcast, whether it's been social media, and you start to really look at your numbers and see where people are engaging with you the most and where you're getting the most um, ROI essentially, because even if it's just your time, you still want to figure out if that was a return on investment because time is money. Once you kind of understand what's working, what's not, then I think that's when you're ready. It's that uncomfortable moment where you're like, you feel like you've hit the wall. You're like, this is so good. Like I have this many people who've, who've done this. I have these testimonies. I've had this opportunity. Every time I go to speak, I get like a new customer or client or whatever it is. And you're hitting this moment where you're like, it's time to to level up out of this and you're uncomfortable and you're like, there has to be more. That's when I think it's really time to bring in either a consultant or somebody to evaluate and work with you and say, you know what, you're absolutely right. This is a perfect time for you. This is a perfect thing for us to target this or for us to look at your um your sales uh, copywriting, you know, for when you put your ads out there, if you need a special landing page, 
and you can have someone evaluate that. But I always think when you're feeling that moment of you've, you've hit it and you're like, how do I get past this? That's when you're ready to hit the next level. Something you said, um, where are people engaging with you the most? I think that's, that's the sort of the key part is, Mm -hmm. is tracking that, right. Whether that is understanding, you know, when I have a sales call, I have a question on the intake form that's required. Where did you hear about me? And I make sure I know where my clients come from. Um, and then, you know, when setting up like different things, like when I have different lead magnets, um, where people are signing up, like I will change the URL so that I know, like this person found me from this URL that I put on my Instagram versus out in my podcast. So I'm, I'm, I know like what channels are they coming from? And I think it's important to know that stuff. And I think that, can I just tell you, like, this is something that a lot of people really struggle to identify and I'll have clients who, you know, multi seven figure clients. And they're like, we're spending $10,000 a month on ads. Can we spend more? And I'm like, well, Okay. I'm pro collection now. I know. Well, I mean, these are like not small businesses, right? Yeah, these are, true, you know, but... mid seven figures. Like I'm, I'm still, I, I want to see the ROI. And so I ask, you know, they ask me how much can we spend on ads? And I say, well, how much does your ads bring in? And they're like, we don't know. And then they have people running the ads and the people running the ads for them also can't tell us mm-hmm. how much money it brings in. And it, honestly drives me nuts because I think that, I don't know, I just feel like there are, it is possible using the technology that we have at our disposal these days to be able to track like when you're spending money, big money on these things. Like we need to know what the return is. Right. Mm -hmm, And so I think it's knowing like where people engage. I think so many people are like hung up on social media these days too. And you know, for me, like Instagram does bring in clients sometimes, but it's not like, if you think about marketing, right? Like it's not necessarily like Instagram isn't going to bring in, like, isn't going to grow my audience drastically. It's not there. It's really there to like, once they have heard of me, then they can come and check out my social media. And that brings them one step closer, you know, no like trust, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, understanding like your funnel, your, your funnel. And I don't mean like having a fancy sales funnel, but just like, right. what is the process that is working for you? And are you maxing that out? And then taking it like when I was maxing out my referrals, right. Then I was like, okay, well, I'm getting a steady number of referrals. I don't know if it would be worth my time to go do more networking. I think I could spend some time doing, you know, leveraging other people's audiences. And that has worked really well like asking yourself really, like, what is the ROI? And then the other thing I'll say too, is we, I think about conversion rates a lot. And so like, if people are doing sales calls, like I, I have clients who are like, well, I want to like bring in, I want to run ads on Google. Cause a lot of people find me on Google. And then if they're doing sales calls and I'm always like, tell me your conversion rate on your sales calls and tell me like the people who aren't buying, why are they saying no? And for people who are doing sales calls, as an example, if their conversion rate is like 50%, in my opinion, is sort of my target. Mm -hmm. If you're closing like 10% or 20%, that tells me that something is off with who you're bringing in. And if you turn on the ad spend, you're just going to bring in more of the wrong people. Oh, absolutely. So so how do you make sure that like your marketing brings in the right person? Because in, in marketing, you know, like you say for people like, know your numbers, you know, you have to know your numbers. I always say, know your numbers, but as in know your data. And that's why I earlier was like talking about these, um, you know, whoever's giving you a suggestion in reels, or there's some of these like sales and training classes and things like that. Well, they'll tell you to throw money at stuff. Um, they don't tell you how to track it. And you're absolutely right with the tech that we have. Um, you can get that information and see where people are coming. And I think when we talk about like conversion and ROIs, like, especially from a marketing perspective, um, we're going to throw out another acronym, KPI. We're going to talk about your key performance indicators. And I think that's something that businesses forget is, you know, like you'll do a $10,000 ad spend, but have you set up like, okay, well, to, to judge if this was a success, you know, we need to look at how many people 
was it, you know, targeted towards? What was the the range? You know, did we go too large? Did we go too small? Um, then you have to look at how many people, if it was, you know, something to click, how many people clicked it, how many people went through it, how many people got to the end, but maybe didn't, you know, convert or didn't do something like that. You have to have the data to see that because like you said, that's when you'll see that there's a problem there and you need to go back in either as your team to look at that. And I think an important thing with, with conversion rates and, you know, and I love that you talked about like, not everything has to be social media. Um, we forget that sometime. And I remember, I want to say it was either years blur now, either in, in 2020 or 2021, Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp, because they're owned by the same company went down. And there are some businesses that their only kind of avenue to communicate with customers and clients is Instagram. And if that goes down from a tech, you're sitting there for a day, just like, what do I do? I can't talk to my customers and my consumers today. Um, but yeah, I think with conversion rates, you really need to know your data because that's when you can see where the holdup is. And you can see if the holdup, you know, if you can't find out who they are to ask them directly, which is, we always want to be like, why didn't you buy? Why didn't you do this? You can see uh, if they're hanging up before they get to the sales portion, before they get to the click here. So that means something might be wrong with your content, that you've lost somebody, that you're not speaking to them directly. May not, it's, I, I guarantee you it doesn't mean that you have a bad product. It just means if they're stopping at this one page, maybe it's too long. Maybe it's not meaty enough. Maybe it's too high level and they want to know specifically what's in it for me. And you're not giving them that. And then why are they going to go to the next page where they give you your, their credit card information? Um, so I think when we're talking about conversion rates, really look at the data. Another point, like don't put all your eggs in one basket, especially when it comes to online and social. I know we're programmed now to be so online these past few years. Um, I will say one of the best things, the biggest ROI I've ever had was when I started my business, I sent out almost my, I call it a press release. It was really an email to all of my contacts, um, even family members, um, you know, that maybe I don't see all the time, but just letting them know what I was doing, what my business was, here are the type of clients I'm looking for and what I'm trying to do. And I still get referrals from that email and it's been six years. Um, so don't forget when we're throwing money at things, yes, there's an opportunity to, to really hone in on ads. Don't forget that you have your own network probably. So instead of always chasing this unknown over here, this, this audience, this thing, you might already have an audience and not realize it. So I think one of the biggest conversion rates you can do that won't cost you anything is to actually talk to people who are in your community, who are in your family, your friend circle, let them know that you're looking for clients because you never know who they're going to have an interaction with. And then you know, as you continue to grow, then you can look at spending money. But if you don't have the data behind it to see where people are either going through the process, stopping the process, um, you're just wasting money then. Okay. So many good points. I think the diversification piece is important all the time, all the time, but especially like as we're going into a recession, I think that it becomes even more important. Like don't put all your eggs in one basket in anything yeah. you do whether that is investments or whether that's in your sales and marketing. And so I've talked to people about this because I've had clients who their sole sales channel will be Google or Amazon, right? And if they get a, a bad rating, I had a client who got shut off. They get, um, in this case, they actually had a trucking business and their mm -hmm. main um, source of revenue was like getting booked from Amazon and they lost their Amazon rating for a month and this had like revenue tanked. Mm -hmm. And another one who all of her leads came through Google and her Google business page got shut down, right? Okay. All her leads got shut down for the month. And so I think there's like, don't get, and I've been thinking about this too, as I'm sort of like increasing my, you know, digital ad spend, like testing out that sort of side of the business. I'm like, you know, we're simultaneously seeing Facebook laying off all these employees. And I'm not saying like Facebook's not going to go down anytime soon. I think there's yeah. too many people on the platform, but just understanding, like, I don't necessarily want to put all of my 
digital ad eggs or all of my marketing eggs into the Facebook basket because, you know, what if it does go down, right? Um, so I think diversification is important. So I have worked with business owners who want to sell, or I have a newer client, for example, who came on and she started her business branded as her. Mm-hmm. And then she is ready to shift out and like hire somebody to run the day to day. And she wants to just sort of be more behind the scenes. And, you know, even me, I have in the last couple of months separated out my Instagram profile. So I have like my personal branding profile and my business profile. But if you go to my website, you know, my business is still very much branded around my face. Right. At what point is it a good idea for somebody to make that shift in their branding from, you know, relying on like me as the face versus coming up with, you know, a young and co brand independent of me, which I'd have to change the name, but that's another story, right? At what point is that a good idea? Um, I think it's a good idea when you start to realize that you need a separation, you know, and, and that's something that I think a lot of business owners go through. I mean, even with myself of like um, establishing my business, um, when I did, I was um, still going through, had just gone through a divorce and I didn't want to use my last name at the time because that was my ex's last name. And I was like, I don't want his name anywhere. Um, so I had to go back and really think about it and pick something that meant something to me. And as obviously as a mermaid, ocean means a lot. So I wanted something to be, you know, fixing. So I wanted to have that separation, but I think it is um, hard. But I think once you're starting to get that again, when you're hitting that moment and you're like, I just don't want it all to be about me anymore. And this is very timely because this is kind of where I'm at right now of, of growing my business in a way where I'm there and I want to have my stuff, but I want other people involved. And so I think it's when you are are hitting kind of that wall. And then I think there is like a strategy around it that that businesses can do that isn't going to be very cost intensive. Um, a lot of it is just updating how you tell your story very subtly on whether it's your newsletter, whether it's your podcast, whether it's your social media of starting to introduce the people with your company is like the easiest way where you're like, oh, meet so-and-so they've joined and they're going to be in this position. So if you um, come into this program or you do this, like this is the person you're going to, you're going to meet and you're going to interact with. So then they're like, oh, okay. So then they start to realize like, well, maybe, okay, Sarah's cool, but I really like so-and-so with what they're, they're talking about. So then as you start to introduce that you're growing and introduce these new people, you can slowly pull back. And you can just have branding then that is more about the business. You can still be a part of it where it's like, you know, you like having a podcast, like on your newsletter, having like a Sarah's corner moment where you can talk about like lesson learned or, um, you know, something, you know, to be aware of as we're going into like a potential recession season, different things like that, how you can protect your business. So they still know that it's your business, but you're not the business anymore. So there's like little things you can do that'll gradually get people to be like, oh, there's more people involved. It's not just Sarah. It's not just Aaron. And then kind of talk about like the offerings of the business and have maybe more general pictures of like the team around a table or there's just different things you can do and people adapt to it really quickly. We put more pressure on ourselves of like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen in my business if they're not seeing me every day. But People, if they're already following you and seeing, they're already a fan and they actually want to see you grow and evolve. So it's, it's more about us internal conflict of like, what does this mean versus our audience? Because most people are like, oh, this is great. Your, your business is growing. You're hiring. Oh, look, there's, there's so-and-so, um, you know, I've, I've had it where I had a program recently and I was trying to take my face back a lot from the launch. And I hired a, um, a, like a community manager to help be the point of contact for everything. And the messaging I got back from people was, oh my gosh, you're growing. This is amazing. What a great thing. Oh, you know, can't wait to, to meet her and can't wait to talk to her. So it's more, there are gradual steps you can do and it, it doesn't take as long as people think it does. I'm in this place too. Um, I 
feel pretty strongly that one of my 2023 big goals will be hiring other CFOs um, to have, you know, additional support CFOs in my group program for people, you know, more to give them, not just to take me away. It's not about taking me away. Like I will still be there, but like adding on an additional layer of support that they get more than what they can get just from me by myself. Um, and then also, you know, I'm, I think I've said before, like I'm getting fairly close to capacity for the amount of clients that I personally can handle. And so, you know, bringing on another CFO and I've tried to shift a little bit more into um, this year talking about the framework that I use that I will like anybody who comes on will be sort of taught my framework and the way that I do things so that I can make sure that they're up to my standards, right? And so that is, it's a scary thing to realize, to, to think that I'm like in a place where it's not all about me anymore. Um, but I think that it is a good shift to make. And then, you know, if you do eventually want to step back and not be the face of your business and not have to, you know, be the one there day in and day out, or if you even want to sell one day, I think that it's really good to have a brand that someone else can step into mm -hmm. and fill your shoes. And, you know, that'll just make your life easier. So starting to slowly, you know, make those steps, I think is, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So this has been so good, so much information, um, that I think, you know, to summarize, tell me if I'm wrong. I think that we need to have the foundational pieces in place before we go and blow up, you know, all of these other marketing channels. I think that squirrel brain happens more so in marketing than anywhere else in business. Absolutely. Um, and so having the foundational pieces in place is something I know you help people with. So tell me about that. I've said like the small businesses are my passion and I'm really passionate about people starting off correctly. Um, kind of had a Twitter conversation about startups and even people who are going through funding rounds of you'll see people with this incredible like oh we're, we're going to do this we're going to do this but they have no marketing strategy they don't know who their audience is um they just have an idea and i think that that sets businesses back because sometimes you're you're in the middle of it maybe you're making sales maybe things are happening and then you realize oh gosh i have to go back to the beginning and start so i'm really passionate about foundation and what I've done within my business is really understand, you know, there's consulting with larger companies and then I want to serve small businesses. Um, and I know sometimes like we've talked about, it can be cost prohibitive to have somebody on a retainer. So I created um, the Blue Tie Creative Concierge Service. You pay a monthly fee. And during the month, you get an hour of strategy with me. You get guest speakers that'll talk about things like SEO, how to write dynamic sales copy, what is crisis communications and why you need it from day one, um, you know, ad spends, different things like that. So you're building a foundation, but you also have the support. Like we'll help you if you're like, hey, that's a great idea. We need to pitch that or we need to get that. You know, you're doing this event. We need to get you on this calendar with uh, this local publication or wherever you're at to bring more people in. So that's the commitment to the foundation that I have is because I want people to start off on the right foot, not having to backtrack when they're already, you know, in the weeds and the thick of things. Um, I want to make sure that people are moving forward instead of having to go back and, and correct things that they didn't do in the first place. But I also say from a foundation standpoint, whether you come to the concierge service or not, not necessarily a plug, but I'm here if you need me, um, is don't hire people right off the bat um, because you don't know who you need. It was like you kind of said, you know, having someone who handles ads but doesn't know how to give you the data. That's not a good thing. They should be able to give you monthly reports or anytime you do a campaign or anything like that, give you a report. So don't hire until you understand. And I say, spend money on consultations. You don't have to hire someone for social media or SEO, but they can give you a consultation and give you maybe like a draft calendar of how you can post on social media and ideas. Um, you don't have to hire someone to do your PR and marketing, but maybe they can work through with you the who, what, when, where, why, how, figure out your mission statement, get you um, clarity on that. So then you can have an elevator pitch and then you've got that foundation, but you're not spending a monthly retainer on things. 
I think there's ways to do that without um, already putting yourself in a, in a precarious situation if you overspend at the beginning and then you're scrambling to make sales and things like that. So I say um, foundation is key. Um, make sure you don't spend more than you're ready to, but that there are resources out there that can sit down with you and make sure that you're getting started correctly. Because as Sarah and I have learned, you can do it your own on your own, but it's more fun with other people and you end up getting farther along in the process when you use other people's talents to help you move forward. I agree. I think that I, you know, I'm in a place where I just don't care about the free content anymore. I don't care about lead magnets. I just value my time more. Mm -hmm. I think everybody gets to this place at some point where you just realize like, I just don't want to DIY it. Um, and so I think with marketing, it's important to take sort of a hypothesis, like testing approach of, I think that this will work. I think if I do PR, if I get in this many news publications and I'll get this many clients and test it out and don't commit yourself to it, to your point, like Absolutely. get a console or like a VIP day sort of thing could be a really great option in some of these things just to test out the theory. And then once you get comfortable saying like, okay, if I do, you know, I tested out my podcast interviews. I know that if I do this many podcast interviews in a month, then I will get this many sales. Mm -hmm. And then if we know that that is the ROI, then you could say, okay, maybe I can now outsource someone to pitch these things for me. Exactly. And this will cost me this much, but because I have already tested out, I feel comfortable knowing this will bring me this number of clients and I'm comfortable with the ROI and say at least like a minimum of a three X ROI is generally what I would say you know, I think less than that, you're not going to make any money. I think that that's a whole other conversation. I didn't even talk about like, I see clients spending all this money on digital ads and then not working, not worrying about the repeat customers, the current client base, like all the other things you could do. Like, we'll, we'll talk, we'll save that one for later. I know the nurturing, that whole conversation is, is a completely different conversation. Cause you're right. Like there's a focus on this group over here that you haven't met or touched yet, but you're not thinking about the group here that's already your, you know, your cheerleader, your ambassador. They they love what you're doing. They're bringing in, you know, referral sources for you. There's opportunity to give them more engagement, more upset, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, yeah, the nurturing process could be a whole other podcast. Yes, yes. And how nurturing does not necessarily equal um, thousands and thousands of dollars spent. Yes. Yeah. I think getting like the repeat clients for mm -hmm. one is way cheaper and they already love you, right? Exactly. Like you do a good job. They already love you. Okay. Well, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. We'll like save it. <laughs> um, my last question is tell me something that, you know, your business will afford you in terms of a life upgrade. Like what's a goal? Like what's a fun thing that you want to spend on one day? That your business will let you do? Um, I want to take a month off and travel either Europe or travel, go do a cross country road trip um, here, you know, in the States or somewhere else, but just take a month away and travel and, you know, do a big, leave the animals with my, my parents uh, for a month or something like that. And just, uh, travel and be immersed in something that is not business and learn something and um you know maybe even learn a new language you never know so that is something that my business is in the process of affording me and the goal is to do it next year so in the planning process of figuring out um destinations and what's working out so that sounds awesome being able to take the time off in more than like a day i think months at a time would just be like mind blowing to me. I'll get there one day. You will, you will. And it's, it's something I've thought about is, you know, we always talk about like self-care and take a day to yourself and that that's great. Um, but usually if we're taking a day, we still think about work. Um, I'm one of those ones that's like, no, let's just go on an adventure. Um, no connectivity or maybe a little connectivity, but like it just, just do it. And, and I think that's something that, um, even if we can do it a day, I know we can't, but I tell everyone go to like Montana. When I went to Montana in certain places, there is no Wi-Fi. There is no data. You're just, your phone is essentially a camera and it is the most um, unnerving, beautiful, humbling thing that you will ever go through. And I think it, it helped me as a business owner. 
Yeah, I know it takes me a while to even begin to relax. Um, well, I appreciate your time. Tell us before we go, where can we find you? Yes, you can find me. Uh, my website is bluetidecreative.com. Um, and you can find me at um, Blue Tide Creative on uh, Instagram, on LinkedIn, um, all the socials. If you want to find me personally, <laughs> I'm a character. Um, you can find me at Aaron uh, M. Breeden on uh Instagram and then just Aaron Braden elsewhere. Awesome. We will put all your links in the show notes. Go check her out. If you are hearing this and like, I need my marketing foundations, I need some strategic support. Um, go check out her concierge service. I think that sounds amazing. And Aaron, I so appreciate you being on and taking the time and, um, we'll see you see everybody next week. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Now, I want you to go take some action. What's one thing you can do this week to create more profit in your business? Send me a DM on Instagram at youngcocfo and share your action item with me. If you have a question or topic you'd like me to dive into, or if you're feeling empowered about taking charge of your finances, let's continue the conversation. Go to profitandprosper.co to submit a question or topic for me to talk about on the show. And because we all profit and prosper better with friends, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe wherever you listen, and share the episode. Make sure you tag me at youngcocfo on Instagram so I can give you some love, and I'll see you in the next episode.